you everyone so much for being here. This has been, you know, an event that we've been dreaming of for months and months and now it's finally here and we're so stoked for all of the amazing readers we have. Um, so I'm kind of just going to go straight into it. Our first reader is Ching Ching Tan, pronoun she, hers. Um, and she is a Chinese immigrant living in the U.S. for 16 years. Her journey of education and writing began in taking ESL courses in community colleges. She received her BA in linguistics at UCSD, MA in communications at San Jose State, and she is currently pursuing an MFA in San Jose State and writing her first memoir, Naturalize. Thank you so much, Ching Ching. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, USF. Uh, so I'm going to read a piece called Oh, Small Peanuts, and then uh, I'm making it a shorter version. So I find it very interesting. I'm making a small peanuts even shorter, so I'm making myself disappear. So <laughs> it is just weird. But uh, that's uh, not uh, what it sound like and in order to see the fuller uh, version of it I'm sharing the the link um, on chat so if you want to see the fuller story that is there but right now I'm reading the shorter and smaller peanuts right there okay I'm gonna get started the first time I saw Americans I was 15 years old in China my brother brought home two people that day a mother and her son from Nebraska I don't remember what she looked like. All I learned in the world I lived in suggested to me that Americans meant white. The first encounter proved it. I have a picture of the boy named Joseph. Most memories were blurry, only these peanuts. Common courtesy for our family would be to serve tea with snacks when guests visited. My mother offered many things that I don't recall. After some polite but stiff conversations, our guests were about to leave. My mother brought the plate with a handful of peanuts, pressing it earnestly, urging them to stay. Have some peanuts, have some peanuts. This is our Chinese way. To keep you for longer means we cherish you and the relationship. It's our hospitality. Besides, my mother is such a Taoxin person. This word Taoxin literally means scooping out the heart. She would not hesitate to scoop her ha heart out for you if she cares about you. Today at age 86, hands shaky and no longer able to sit up straight, my mother still has a reflex to serve tea on all occasions. She suddenly leans forward and prepares to rise only to realize the effort is outside the will of her body. She serves that's what she does and has always done. On that day, mother poured tea and waved her hands upward to offer the peanuts. I could see that our guests wanted to leave but were reluctant to do so. Joseph's mother smiled apologetically at the peanuts. Oh, the small ones. Even with my very limited English, I understood. But what did I understand? When craving hits, I go to 99 Ranch Market to get a bag of salty boiled sun-dried peanuts, a product from mainland China to indulge in my old time pleasure, a bag of peanuts from 6,000 miles away. I crack open the tiny shells with both hands, thumbs, indexes, and middles, then pour the tiny pearls, sometimes only singular, onto my palm before sending them into my mouth. While slowly gnawing them, I allow the cycle to repeat, gnawing and cracking. I feel that the chewing I hear creates a bubble around me, my jaw moving, my mind freeing. The bubble allows me to be part of the light conversations. Sometimes it's important to chat about nothing. Peanuts, big or small, are our way of life. 15-year-old me wondered if there was a bigger way of life out there. Our family was moderately affluent. I never felt poor, but I sensed something larger was out there, out of my understanding of it at the time and for a very long time. The size of that world, a much bigger peanut, was ahead of me by about 20 years. Something about geography that some distance away, there were places in the world that are bigger or even better according to whom I did not know. 
since the peanut account encounter in, 80, in the 80s, China's peanut production has grown substantially. To sell more peanuts to, uh, to China, peanut conferences in the US explore strategies. And I heard this. One thing we heard loud and clear is Chinese customers have very low expectation of peanut products. They expect rancid and stale peanuts. I wonder how business dealing could be so condescending. To my ear, it sounded like, here, leftover ones, you can have those. China today plays a significant role on the international stage. It's hard not to hear about China in the news now. The tiny peanuts we crack continuously in the bubble seems to invoke a sound of firecrackers. The millions and trillions of peanut cracking cause the world to shake, causing an earthquake. I hope this is not what they call the China threat. I wish to live in a world that only compares the sizes the size of peanuts without judgment, the sizes of things, not to compare the expansion of power, not to perpetually look down, not to make less than or toss around. We are the small peanuts, coarse skin outside, low key and easy to slide into obscurity, but we want to be the unpretentious ones. When cracked open, we're pearls. Thank you. Wow, that was incredible, Ching Ching. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, since none of us can unmute, let's all show love in the chat. Uh, that was amazing. And I'm gonna intro our next reader, also coming to us from San Jose State, Umi Ali, uh, pronoun she, her. And Umi is a teaching assistant and MFA student at San Jose State University where she studies fiction and poetry. Her work deals with issues of patriarchy and immigrant families, third, third culturalism and displacement. When she isn't writing, Umi likes running and spending time with her partner and three spirited children. Hey guys, um, thanks so much for having me. Um, like Ching Ching, I also edited these pieces. So I'm gonna read two poems for you guys tonight and hopefully they still sort of make sense and you know, tie up together nicely. This one's called Self-Portrait as a Former ESL Student. What is Urdu but a string of hard consonants, a trick of breath and teeth, I say out loud, knowing Iqbal must be turning in his grave, knowing at any moment my mother will say it's a shame her daughter is so blunt and but the mees. but my mouth is an open wound, carved by the ones who once corrected my English, taught me my A, E, and I, O, U's. I think of these sounds I've adopted, still homeless as they split again and again from my bone and lips, haddi and haunt. Sometimes I think it isn't even mine, this mouthpiece, a white flag I didn't plant but still wave. My words betray me and all I perpetuate is the cycle of, now repeat after me, I think of the countless times I mispronounce my own name in one day. Doesn't matter how I call myself or who responds. I am a riddle, I think, and the answer is home, always at the tip of my tongue, forever out of my reach. How now, brown cow, I think, but the air in my lungs bears no allegiance to lines and geography, only to the present, only to the possibility of who who I become whenever I speak, only to the weight of the sound of my voice emerging from the walls of my body, my body, my body. Maybe my body will return me to my birth, release me from this hocus pocus, this fantasy, this silly alphabet and syllabary. Maybe my body will fill in these blanks, these white fingerprints with my dark flesh and Urdu consonants. Now repeat, after me. This one's called Lockdown Zuhitsu. Panic buying board games and books while everyone else hoards toilet paper and disinfectant wipes, day and night kaleidoscope into one another and I become the clock hand cleaving, churning, dividing again and again. Noon begets infinite noons until 12 isn't 12 isn't 12 anymore and dusk is only heresy. Attention, we have entered an extended period of dormancy. Alexa, 
How long is an extended period? Each day is purgatory, an eclipse of memories. I unlearn how to embrace other bodies, but their sensory prints remain. Everything can be washed away except turmeric. Anti-inflammatory, antiseptic, antioxidant, and antidepressant. Two spoonfuls with a cup of boiling milk to heal your insides from exhaustion, paranoia, internal bruising, migraines, or collectively your in-laws. Another spoonful to boost libido. Nothing else sticks as unrelentingly. Alexa, where do I buy a five foot tall fiddle leaf fig? Alexa, where can I donate all of my bras? Subscription boxes for makeup, rejected produce, and designer bags. Indulgent and entirely unnecessary, except who says no to a brown box? I think bi-monthly, plant-based, hair dye will save me, but the drain catches all of my hair. I try an Ayurvedic soothing facial mask so I won't need to adjust my brightness. Alexa, what tools do I need to repair my outlook on life? For inspiration, I look at pictures of hermit crabs on the internet and study their life cycle. They enjoy a full social life, apparently, but only live to the age of 40. I think my DNA needs to enlist in the witness protection program. At the farmer's market, a woman yells at everyone for wearing a mask, a hijab, a turban. We infringe on her freedom, her right to breathe. We don't tell her to fuck off when she is asked to leave the market. Herd immunity. Alexa, how many people of color died from COVID today? Alexa, are you listening? Thank you. All right, let's give it up for Umi, everyone. That was amazing. Wow. Some of those left me breathless. Um, I am going to go into our first USF reader, Jake Warren, pronouns they, them. And Jake Warren made their way here from Kansas City, Missouri, by way of Portland, Oregon, where they graduated from Portland State University with a BFA in creative nonfiction, a proud member of the prairie band Potawatomi Nation. They live in San Francisco with their partner of eight years. Thank you so much. Uh, before we start, I just want to thank the Graduate Writers Association for hosting the readings and um, as well as all of you for attending. Um, thank you so much. It is great to be with you tonight. Um, this excerpt is from a story called Love Waves, which reassesses my memories of my first and violent relationship through the lens of earthquakes in California. It follows a section that likens trauma's effects on memory to the fragmentation of Southern California by the San Andreas Fault. Um, it takes place in October, 2011 um, and does contain heavy references to self-harm. Just wanna put that out there. This memory stands alone, a painting salvaged from the wreck of my relationship with Adam. It is the sole survivor of an early series and cannot be observed under normal circumstances. The world it was intended for is hostile to it now. Light and air threaten the integrity of the canvas, so the painting must remain submerged in deionized water. To hold the waterlogged membrane in your latex gloved fingers is to warp the picture's depth and perspective, meaning the memory can best be viewed through a milieu that slightly distorts it. I can't remember what happened in the minutes before or after this, and the days on either side have also disappeared. That late afternoon plays like a recurring dream and always begins in his living room. The perimeter swells to larger than life and the limited evening sun in the window wanes to a twilight blue. Consciousness comes to and settles behind my eyes like a tule fog. It's quiet. A sourceless amber glow reflects off the walls and their glossy white baseboards. I make note of it from the couch when I look in the direction of the stairs then my instincts intervene and gently turn my head the other way. Though I know what I will find when I get there, I dread those six small steps to the kitchen every time. I wanna say the slotted bifold doors to the room were open, but in my recollection, they're closed. I part them slowly. 
Little plastic wheels squeak in their track as a clinical fluorescence expands across my face. Adam sits beneath the window at the end of the room, knees against his chest, his back to a washing machine that I often think look, looks awkward by the stove. He shudders, head balanced on the arms which lie folded over his knees, and jutting from Adam's fist is a paring knife. My eyes will forever gravitate to its near uniform color, both blade and hilt the same hazmat orange except for the stainless steel edge. Neither paint nor plastic can conceal the true purpose of the tool, to divide an object by itself as many times as possible. It shivers in his clenched white hand. I speak to him harshly, it appears, since I pinch my brows into the shape of disappointment. My face contorts to admonish him. My larynx thrums with vibration. I can smell the rotten carrots in the compost bin, but I can't hear a thing. Adam faces the wall. I notice his bald spot and look for just a second, but I have to stay focused on that knife. My teeth scrape against one another. I can't believe we're here again. Had he already started? Will his gray and yellow sleeves gleam with an iron dampness when he stands and unfolds his arms? No, not yet. I saw my first of his many self-administered wounds that night. Cigarette burns, little domes of scorched red flesh near the crook of his left forearm. Our exchange went something like, J, when was that? A, day or two ago. J, why didn't you talk to me? A, you don't fucking care. I bit my upper lip as my actions thrown back at me slid from my face like spit. I threatened to leave him the week before. His only weapons then were fists, which at the time he swung not at me, but himself. What disturbed me about watching Adam brutalize his own eyes and face was not the sheer force he subjected them to, but how he didn't even seem to feel it. It took all my strength to wrap my arms around him like a lariat and squeeze. There were tears, always, no matter how negligent, cruel, or horrific we'd been to each other. The kitchen standoff ended only after I gave up approval and sank to the floor, my head in my hands, exhausted from bawling hot salt. To my short-lived relief, Adam set the knife aside, scooted closer, and cried with me as another wave of terrified tears caught me by surprise. I clutched him and sobbed as if he'd actually stepped back from the yawning edge of oblivion. It's a shame about the words. Excess salinity corrodes both paint and canvas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jake, for sharing that. Wow, everyone is really bringing it tonight. Thank you, everyone that's gone so far. Um, I'm gonna go into our next USF reader, Sarah Cruz, pronouns she, her. Um, and Sarah Cruz is an MFA candidate program at the University of San Francisco. She has been published in Hotel America, Shining Rock Poetry Review and others and currently lives in San Francisco. Thank you, Sydney. Okay. So um, the poem that I'm gonna read is, uh, was inspired by uh, Jan Beatty's Switching Yard and has a epigraph to that effect. So, uh, no use in a center. I'm at home on the train, it's blankness and anonymity. I'm at home when I'm not at home. Approaching Denver, Union Station, Jan Beatty. Blankness is what I need. Surrounded by too many voices, you start to think the echoes your own, the noise and the dirty dishes in the sink, losing all sense of motion and nothing but a window to watch the trains go by. Passengers have been reduced. Here in the West, the monolith of freights have taken over the rails with their noisiness and cars full of coal, tankers full of oil stretched over the landscape for miles. Anonymity, saving grace, when you realize your identity was shaped by continual chorus of constraint and abuse, 
Isolation made you love loneliness. Escape and return motion. I'm learning the language of trains. The short whistle from the long, solid sound of Amtrak against the noisy rumble of freights. Like New York taxis during midtown five o'clock traffic. Next lane, stalled car, get out of the way, I'm moving over. Or at least that's what I imagine they're saying. Shave and a haircut resounds only after 10 p.m. In motion, I can't hear the sound. Escape and return, looking for a center, disappearing to New York, Northeast Regional, New England towns, Bronx warehouses, underground pen, north on Boston commuter rail, waiting on a wooden bench in Providence Station for the reader board numbers whir and click into place. Mobius strip landscape, lake, pond, Roxbury, row, house, underpass, graffiti, station platform arriving. Learning things when you've lost them. Here, there is no motion because the station's a museum of unorganized artifacts that no one wants to read or understand. The motion of mind, the need for its own silence resounding through dark space of darkening windows, untethered from expectation, suspended universe and plaintive lull. That's what I need. But I'm looking out the window at trains that cut through town in the distance with motion and sound out of sync. And I have a very short second poem. Uh, ongoing aberration. Play at the normal, buying groceries at Trader Joe's, daily mail and sweeping the kitchen floor because I know we lose everything. Knots of family and slow unraveling of denial that eclipses all stars. Attracting broken men wanting to tether me to their voids in compliments built on foundations of aggression. All I've known is my own not belonging. How not to take up space, allowing their darkness to swallow everything. Solitude is safety away from the irreal. Desire and what brokenness seeks to make whole through more breaking, as if glass were enough to cradle the ocean. Today, I hope there are enough images. Evening light, eucalyptus in fog, hope ship sounds at 4 a.m. on a darkening bay, remembered in another future will sustain me from the pull of gravity that lives in the weight of blood and family resemblance, exploding like houses aflame in a quiet suburb of the mind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Let's show some love in the chat. Um, we love a poem inspired by Jam Beatty. And also, I remember one of those poems from Workshop, and it gets better every time. So thank you. Um, OK, our next reader is going to be Katie Ziegler, pronouns she, her. And Katie is a writer and professor who holds a BA and MA in English from Stanford and is currently pursuing her MFA in creative writing from St. Mary's College. She has performed her readings of short fiction for Why Are There Words, the Peninsula Literary Society, and was recently featured as a guest on In Short, the podcast. Thank you so much. This is so lovely to spend this time with you all. Thank you all to our readers that have gone already, and I can't wait to hear everyone else. And thank you so much, Sydney, for all your help getting us all here tonight. Um, I'm going to be reading a short excerpt from my novel in progress, which tells the story of a woman named Rosie who has had to move home to care for her father who is in the late stages of dementia. Um, and this is a scene from when she's sort of thinking back upon when she first learned that she needed to move home. I roll down the window a smidge and breathe in the fresh air. The fields are quiet and the sun is hidden behind a gray fog, making everything seem smooth and unbroken. I turn on the radio and my mind turns to my dad again. 
four years since his Alzheimer's diagnosis, a proclamation that he met with a dismissive flourish of his hand and a reinvigorated commitment to Sudoku. And for almost three years, it was manageable. There was memory loss, difficulty locating certain words. I specifically remember him pounding his fist on the table when he couldn't think of the word mahogany. But I could visit every month and the neighbors looked in on him as did Sue, Mary Ann, a miniature congregation of care. Then 18 months ago, Ray was driving Jackson back to school and they came upon my dad wearing only jeans and a t-shirt, his stockinged feet soaked from the rain, walking along the shoulder of the highway. Months later, Jackson admitted that at first he thought dad was homeless, a transient hoping to find shelter in the next town. And it wasn't until Ray looked in the rearview mirror and saw dad's signature Bob Seeger shirt a vintage North American tour short that was usually kept in a vacuum sealed bag in the basement that he pulled over and ran back, leading my dad into the warm car. Marianne called me that night. I was in Nashville drunk at some honky tonk with an indie folk band that I'd just written an album worth of songs for. We were celebrating a great day of recording and I couldn't quite hear what she was saying on the other end, but after stepping outside, it was clear. Rosie, you need to come. She didn't need to explain. I knew what she was talking about, even though I didn't stay on the phone long enough to hear the details of the highway or the long ride home, during which my dad thought Jackson was a fellow policeman, a man named Stanley, whom I only met once before dad left the force. He kept asking Jackson how his wife and kids were, if he still had that hunting lodge over near Sparksville, and Jackson, wise beyond his 18 years, simply held my dad's hand in the back seat and said the wife and kids were doing just great. Dad didn't remember one thing about his journey down the highway. He just laughed and said he was probably trying to get to Katmandu, but there was something in his face, in the angle of his smile that told me something was very wrong. Later that night after he'd gone to bed and everyone had driven home, I walked around the house so familiar I could have kept my eyes closed. On the surface, everything seemed the same. The stack of TV guides, Larry Hagman's face grinning up for me from the top issue, my grandmother's collection of spoons hanging mutely in the kitchen. It was only when I started opening drawers that the truth became appallingly clear. I found at least a dozen half-eaten cups of chocolate pudding in the pantry, his electric razor in the freezer along with the television remote. In the laundry room back near the garage, there was an unmistakable smell coming from behind the exercise bike a black plastic garbage bag slumped against the back wheel. And when I opened it, I found four fitted sheets stained with feces. Further investigation led to more secrets and my heart broke when I found a slip of paper taped to the inside of the medicine cabinet written in his unmistakable hand, Rosie, Oliver, me, family, and a row of exclamation marks below each bigger than the next. When I walked into my dad's room, he was asleep, his arm thrown over his head. We share this trait. Oliver always said it looked like I was raising my hand to answer a question. Teacher's pet, even in your dreams, he'd say. Dad's breathing was rhythmic and crisp as if he was trying to blow something out of his nostrils. He'd left the bedside lamp on and in the small circle of light it afforded, I could see a crossword puzzle cut from a newspaper with only three words filled in. Each word was wrong. There were eye drops and a picture of my mom and me in a plastic frame. I was a baby, maybe eight months, and my mom was holding me on her hip, and I was grabbing a tangle of her long hair in my fist and had the end of it in my mouth. Her face was still, a quiet smile that showed no teeth, but her eyes, blue as the ocean, looked at me as if I was the most miraculous thing she'd ever seen. I stared at the picture until my dad snorted and turned away, rolling toward the wall. I sat down there on the edge of the bed and put my hand on his back, which was slightly damp with perspiration, as if he'd traveled a long, long way to get there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. That was so wonderful. Um, I am going to introduce our next reader, Louisa Fenichel. Louisa's work has been featured or is forthcoming in Guernica Magazine, to Below Quarterly, Poetry Northwest, Palette Poetry, and elsewhere. Her debut collection, All These Urban Fields, was published by Nothing to Say Press. Um, hi, thank you so much to 
Sydney and to everybody else for organizing this event and hosting. Um, and thank you to everybody who's here tonight. I'm going to read um, a sort of in progress, in process poem that I picture being an ongoing thing um, called The Women. Um, and yeah, here it is. One, origin of snow. Sparrow as the creature of infidelity. I am no longer married and never have been. Still, I am in a bone lit dress, plucking at the skeletons of the flounder in the garbage can, teasing apart my threadbare hair, sprawling out atop my queen sized bed, naked and waiting. Two, Origin of the 20th century. I was born during a month of sex and hard wiring, as everybody is wont to do. In a taxi, pinkly, flushed, of course human. Three, origin of the moon over suburban lawns. The house comes to me plainly it's simple as crocheting, which is not so simple, but I see the house and know it belongs to me. Like how the river flows through the peculiar moment that is the park with the children and the small dogs and the dogs large as zebras and the puppies adorable as maybe I once could have been. The house is adorable. The house looks like a dog. Some of my lovers have looked just like me. It's like looking into a mirror, how it reveals certain low hums of loneliness. Four, origin of a marriage. All of my relationships have lasted precisely seven months. At a party, I get drunk and tell a man I once slept with that I have so much love for so many people, but feel selfish for only being able to really love one person. It's simple. When my family's dog died, I was the last to know. It makes sense. I weep like a mother come the end of anything. Five, origin of Jubilee. It can be useful to scrub your hands when feeling exhausted. It's called animal instinct, called splendor. I think when I am older, I will be a cruel bride living in a city. No children, only the pigeons who flank my sides like small islands. Tell me, is it easy for you wherever you are to enjoy my body. Once I loved a man who allowed wasted rays of sun to accumulate wherever we walked. Back then I saw my shadow the easiest, stamping on the grass that got in my shadow's way. I was mean, but I was happy. Six, origin of breath. As an infant, I curled into the kitchen sink, my body the shape of a question about the weather and sadder than all of weather has ever been. Even my corruption is corrupt. I speak into the world, make the leap from glass window to wooden door. Sometimes I do, I think I'm a genius, full of longing and ill-formed moth staring into the street lamp as it curves its lone way through the leaves of the sidewalk tree. And I'll end there, thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Let's all give it up for Louisa and all of our amazing MFA students that have gone so far from San Jose, USF, St. Mary's, you guys have all been incredible. Um, and now we're going to head into listening to our USF alums, which I'm so excited about. Our first alum to read is Wendy Tokunaga, a pronoun she, her. And Wendy is a writer, editor, and acclaimed cat servant. 
Her books include Midori by Moonlight, Love in Translation, and Postcards from Tokyo. She lives in San Francisco Bay Area with her Osaka-born husband. And in her spare time, she enjoys singing jazz and bossa nova, drinking wine, and doom scrolling on Twitter. She'll be reading from her novel in progress, Purely Fictional. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Sydney and Michelle, for inviting me. And thank you all for coming. It's a man's voice coming from behind. Young lady, he's saying. Young lady. He can't mean me. And I'm in a rush and I don't like being late, especially not for the most important meeting of my life. That's hyperbole, but I do feel that desperate. It took over an hour to get here, a trip that should have been 30 minutes tops due to my poor sense of direction and the drive-by navigation app blowing up at a pivotal turnoff. Young lady, he's nearly on top of me now. I turn around. A man in a tan raincoat, probably no older than 50, more than a decade younger than me, is holding a blue umbrella with a pink flamingo handle. My umbrella. You drop this, thanks. He hands it to me. Sorry, I'm in a bit of a hurry. No worries, have a nice day. He walks off, but not before smiling and giving me a wink. Young lady. Why would he call me young lady? And why am I now feeling so deflated? As in, maybe this meeting is going to suck. That man knows I'm not a young lady. It's just like the other day at the meat counter at Palmer's Pantry. When I ordered a two pound Cornish hen, the butcher said, anything else, ma'am? When I said no, he addressed the next middle-aged customer saying, what can I do for you, miss? So I'm a ma'am and she's a miss. Well, something's a miss all right and, and it ain't me. Why is my local butcher making a snap judgment about customer ages? I stewed about this for much too long afterwards. I'm 63. There's no question I'm a fucking ma'am, but it really grinds my gears, as Maynard, my dear late hubs, would have said. But I have no time to start stewing again. Looking at the building in front of me, Millbrook College's Farnsworth Hall, I know I'm in the right place. I make a left and halfway down the corridor, I find the office of Edwina Habersham, the head of the creative writing department. A student receptionist instructs me to sit in the cramped waiting area outside of Ms. Habersham's office. In addition to her teaching duties and role as acquisitions editor for the college's literary magazine, The Shimmer Pond Review, Edwina Habersham also provides editorial critiques on fiction manuscripts for a hefty fee. I had sent Edwina the first 50 pages of my magnum opus, The Hungry Goddess. I would not normally use such an expression in referring to my own novel. This is how my friend Leanne described it. Leanne, the one who urged me to contact Edwina, insisting that she would feel the same way about my book as Leanne did which would result in Edwina introducing me to a literary agent or even a publisher. This is how things work in the literary world, Leanne explained. Brenda, Brenda Barker, an imposing woman with short salt and pepper hair wearing a gray tweed poncho, looking like a cross between Mary Todd Lincoln and Dorothy from the Golden Girls opens the door. Yes, Come in and sit down, she says, as if she's about to add, I don't have all day. Edwina's office is filled with books, flowering succulents, and various framed diplomas and awards hanging on the walls. In a far corner is a sculpture of three staggered stone basins, water trickling over each one. The sound is supposed to offer a soothing ambience, but I can only pray that it won't make me want to pee. Edwina puts on her tortoise shell framed glasses, reading glasses, and rifles through what I recognize as my pages, which are dog eared and blood stained with red ink marks. 
an introduction to a literary agent will probably not be on the agenda. I won't mince words, she says. These pages need a lot of work. Perhaps you've bitten off a little more than you can chew. She pauses. Can I ask you something? Yes. She removes her glasses that are attached to a chain that looks like it's made of jujubes. Have you ever taken a creative writing course? No. Edwina nods slowly as if to say, no surprise there. Inside my head, I am now cursing Leanne for ever suggesting that I consult with Edwina Habersham. Edwina goes on talking, mentioning flat characters, a confusing plot, bizarre jumps in time, point of view issues, dangling modifiers, and other words, each and every rookie mistake an amateur can make. I can no longer concentrate. I only wanted to stop. This was a bad idea to have someone like Edwina Habersham read my feeble attempts at creative writing. Why did I ever think I could write? Why did I waste this woman's time? There's nothing to do but change the subject. What do you think of the Sky Ridge Writers Conference, I ask? Edwina looks taken aback, as if she can't imagine how I would know about such a thing. Sky Ridge? It's one of the most well thought of writers conferences in the entire country. They only accept applicants with the highest level of potential. Why do you ask? I applied to it and I just wondered, Edwina smiles kindly, I wouldn't get your hopes up. It seems this can't get much worse. Sky Ridge is extremely difficult to get into and I'm afraid she doesn't continue. Anyway, I've written copious notes on your pages. Please read them carefully. She clips them together. If you have any questions, you can email me. I feel it's a bit of the cart before the horse. As I said, you might do well to take a writing class. Perhaps they offer one at the senior center in your town. Senior center? I know I'm old and everyone seems to be noticing lately, but really, and Edwina must be pushing 50 herself. Thank you for your time. I grab my manuscript and stuff it in my purse. Exiting the doors of Farnsworth Hall, I walk quickly toward the parking lot. I spy a garbage can and toss the pages inside. It was after the Hillwood Ladies Book Club meeting some two years ago when Leanne was giving me a ride home that I gathered the courage to tell her I'd written a book. A book? Leanne looked at me as if I'd announced I was pregnant five years into menopause. So you're a writer? Oh no, I'm not a writer. You wrote a book. What else would you call yourself? I don't know. So can I read it? Read it? Geez Louise, I don't know if anyone should read it. There was one other time I'd considered writing a book. This was back in the dark ages when Maynard and I had been married only a couple of years. I was in the kitchen fixing his favorite cowboy breakfast skillet, sausage, eggs, hash browns, and Velveeta. Don't judge me. I would never consider making such a culinary catastrophe now. I've been thinking of doing something creative, I said to him. Creative? Nerd said, not looking up from his beloved sports section of the newspaper. Yeah, like write a novel. You write a book? Well, I just thought, who'd want to read a book by you? I admit that it stung, but he wasn't aiming to be mean. It was merely his matter of fact way. Maynard was being practical, one of his many good traits along with remembering to replace the toilet paper roll and regularly checking the tire pressure on my Ford Fiesta. It was hard to come up with a reason why anyone would want to read something I wrote. I'd never written anything outside of homework and grocery lists, though I'd always been a voracious reader 
and English was my favorite subject. But after that, I tamped down any desire to express my creativity. I forgot all about writing a novel, but the idea came roaring back once I joined book club, something to keep my mind occupied after becoming a widow so many years later. All these books we'd read, I didn't think much of them. I could do just as well, maybe even better. The urge to write bubbled inside of me like Mount Vesuvius. I couldn't contain it. And my story excited me. I wanted to write about Clementine, a struggling woman chef determined to bring great food to a small town. And helping her are three mentors who communicate with her in strange and glorious ways from the other world. Annapurna, the Hindu goddess of nourishment. Ukemochi, the Japanese Shinto food goddess. And Edizia, the Roman goddess of feasting. I'm not sure where I got my confidence. And don't take this the wrong way, but not having Maynard around anymore to discourage me felt rather freeing. I finally said, why not? I can write a goddamn book. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. That was amazing and hilarious and wonderful. I loved it. Um, okay, next up, we're going to have Randy James Reed, pronouns he, they. And Randy received an MFA in writing from the University of San Francisco. Randy has performed in venues across Los Angeles and the Bay Area. He is a co-founder of At The Door, a monthly reading series that uplifts and features black and brown voices. And his debut chapbook, Shifters, is now available on Nomadic Press. And you guys, it's this chapbook is so good. And I'm not just saying that because... Randy is an angel and I'm biased, but like objectively it is so good. So you guys should all check it out. Okay, thanks Randy. Thank you, Sydney, um, for that introduction. And thank you, Sydney and Michelle and the GWA for putting this um, event together. And um, thank you to all of the readers. Um, so I'm gonna start with a few poems from uh, Shifters. Uh, this one is called, uh, Tonight Calls for a Poultice. Lady fingers lit like a birthday candle, discover nerves beneath a fingernail, a fix, erupt. Voice and blood can join under a sky of blasted chrysanthemums. Hand is kept agonizingly alive by flare, ache. Bowels birth a dread you can rub between your thumb and index as sparklers dance away abandoned. Medic lights revolve as an EMT compresses. As they fade down the block, quarter sticks rattle windows, send car alarms singing. This next poem is titled Suede Interiors. It's good to have fruits in the house. You have fruit, then you're not poor. With an island lilt, my mother wipes dust from her home's never wilting flora. I store away the grocer's plastic, rip and trash the unusable bags. The rice taps, filling its container as a neighbor's car idles. Driver outside coughs a long time. Choosy lover mingles with neighbor's Easter barbecue. From their porch, I love you, don't be careful, don't forget them cigarettes. You know I won't. Driver and friend leave to a saxophone speech, Mr. Gay radiating, blessing the chassis. Smoke in Arabic numbers and Kelly Blue Books say silver. Second place is the best car color to buy, but then burgundy interiors and car phones, Ultima sunroofs and danker skies, them revving Mazda RX-7s, them woofers, them hopeful fruits beg to differ. This next poem, this is the last one that I'll be reading from Shifters, is called Romeo and Riff. You fight your father in the middle of the street and none of the neighbors make a peep. Father and son sauced, bloodletting like sailors copping their moxie. Your navy cardigan resilient, your dad's dingy white tee, the stuff of working men's lore. What night music, beleaguered breath braiding through scuffle. Reaching home, I cry to cold play on my bathroom's tile floor, tears to daylight in the full moon dark. Truth is, if you were built to like boys, I would know real trouble. 
You could make me do anything with your Sal Minio, James Dean wattage, dimples and cigarettes. You are my first Salvation Army, my first hot box. We are Portis Head in half morning light, ever clear with sloppy meat eaters. You are the pre-chorus in the strokes hard to explain. One night in the San Rafael Hills, you sang for no one to the skyline. What a jerk Paul McCartney is not to keep his talent hidden to prevent dashing boys from their best Clooney at karaoke impressions. Lines of boys who can't help treating things around them like piffle. You wear Macca's coat of arms, Romeo, and you are forgiven. Thank you. So these next poems are from a work in progress manuscript. This is called Impressions. Johnny Maria says I'm a fairy with my elfin ears and newly blonde hair. A black man on 16th and Mission calls me a punk for what he believes I let them do to my manhood. I write the back row of the 14 bus with a face of green glitter applied by a bartender whose body resembles a wine glass. Most men avoid me. I wonder, is it the specter of state violence or the unfiltered faggotry? Because when I'm alone, baby, it's a party. It's not the kind of party where they play ACDC unironically, it's sparkle and dye and soft wrists, peak disco beats. I'm talking 73 to 78, I'm talking NYC 80 to 83. And I apologize for no breath of mine. Your hullabaloo is baloney between slices of Wonder Bread when I prefer hostess sweets, honey buns. The next poem is called Girls on the Radio. It's always been boys that turn down the volume from embarrassment. And this next poem is called Defended Jacob and Esau. My brother is a deputy, keeps his two eyes attuned to malefactors. He risks every day to build a better candidate for his son, pouncing around my mother's living room. Deputy wants to make the world from his perch a better place. Cops make me hawk. Call it profiling fatigue. Call it brutality, pocking a map of the United States. Call it history. I tell him I hate cops, hurting him surprisingly. We argue, me and deputy, truly argue. I mean, cacophony, snarls, growls, and tears. I use knee-jerk reactions and raw feelings to hold against his blitz that he is Pop Warner Jr. in varsity football, basketball at the Y, and he is bolstered in this living room by our grandmother. He talks to me not looking at me, his face bruised and smug. In the bluster of our pop-up battle, he repeats, faith without works is just a word, so I hear without a pointed finger what I'm not doing. On the living room floor, he is bootstrapped theory on his hands and knees as my nephew falls in love with the known world. For a first time, I recognize this deputy's presence, like a decorated high official or an impassioned minister. And I realize how I am made to scale, my math summing up to younger brother. I come away emptied of someone else's rhetoric, left with nothing to fill. Uh, the next poem is called, They've Taken the Love Out of Everything, Love. I've learned to show my color to everyone, even for those who look like and may hate me if they were to ever meet me. I show my color because the dirty truth is the world's been made to hate anything darker than a paper bag. I used to think I was safe. I thought and felt it often enough to slip in and on of a veil of comfort always coated white before the real world shook me rough and right to say, fuck white supremacy. With God given Nimbai, everything out us a poem, at least a ballast of meter dancing, like the poet I bore witness to on 16th and Valencia, unbridled in kinesis, sparking our pathos, he, in a moment of rest, says to Manny, you know why I have come. There's a thirst to prematurely fill our plots, but even when I trip or catch a sore throat, I dig us because we are poems, all of us, a subgenre of a subgenre, some a villanelle, some a rubiot, some a boring ass sonnet, some a sexy one with hot shit hair. 
And I'm going to read um, my last poem. This is uh, the title poem of my work in progress manuscript. It's called Wild Card. I found it hard to set healthy boundaries with the world. For a long time, I take it to bed without pause. I know the bind of a firm stance and a fragile ego, what it means to wait for the light to green. I don't have a problem with being called brother when it comes, although I rarely call anyone brother, not even my blood one. I can give my best replication of what to sound like on TV and movies, mono and stereo, on the pulpit, in the barbershop, on stage, ancestors and elders who forged before. I can pepper idioms just so. Still, someone would have something to say. And that has been a great hang up, the wrong kind of caring. For long, I folded small for men bound to corner politics and gangster flicks. But a moment's rest affords my wildest dreams, a single them walking Pershing Square, green, green lawn in a navy sweater and top knot bun, tweed skirt rolled up for the gods. And I take in the day's warmth for a first time, wanting the breeze on my own hairy legs. Picture myself in a Kuji sweater, docks, and a pleated skirt of deep green, awaiting light for it to change. Sometimes in the ease of loved ones, close conversations, I am she or girl without a note of correction. No, I'm not a girl or woman, but it's a natural occurrence. And sometimes I break, knowing this keeps me from the insides of circles, a beard and a skirt at the same damn time, this need for liquid ease, Real men call it everything it is not. I call it outside. I used to be open 24 hours, horror strange mouths, night and day. I used to be afraid of the word black. I used to fear myself, outsiders so often fearful of me. I used to be open 24 hours, born of chaos. Now I bloom in chaos, bloom to save myself from circles and their squares. Thank you. Wow. Whew, Randy, thank you. That was incredible as always. Um, okay, next we have Caitlin Chung, pronoun she, her. Caitlin has lived in the Bay Area her whole life. She's a teacher, an expert eavesdropper, a fan of infomercials, and is known to be a supporter of superstitions. She has on many occasions been justly accused of being a Luddite. She lives in Oakland with her husband and their cat, and Ships of Fate is her first book. Thank you, Caitlin. Hi everyone. Thank you for having me. It's been so wonderful to see all of your faces and hear your words. Happy to be here. I'm going to be reading from my novella, Ship of Fates. I'm going to jump around a bit. You go to see the lighthouse keeper for a story because another story told you to. You've been chasing these stories, the ones about her, about this place and about the old place too. It's taken you a while to find her, but you're ready. It's autumn now. The air is matter of fact in its new chill, especially by the bay. You're standing outside the old lighthouse with your hands in your pockets. The wind unbreakable pushes against your face. The lighthouse hasn't been in use for a hundred years, but it's been left alone. Nobody goes there. The world has nearly forgotten there's a reason to. Underneath your arm is a small bundle of kindling you've brought for the lighthouse keeper. It's left bits of bark and long splinters stuck to your coat. The lighthouse door, about a foot shorter than you, is crusted with salt and blends into the wall, invisible but for a thin black outline and a brass handle. You use the side of your fist to bang against the stone. It's a dull thud that you don't worry will reach the top. You wait for a full minute, listening for sounds inside. The wind feels worse now that you're just waiting. You're right at the edge of the San Francisco Bay, but you feel far, far away from everything. You might as well be the only person left in the world. You bang on the door again and wait. This time, the door is pushed open, scraping a flattened arc in the dirt at your feet. You bow three times, show you've brought kindling as the legend directs, and get your first glimpse of her, the lighthouse keeper. She holds a candle that illuminates half of her face. Without looking directly at you, she backs away to give you the space to slip inside, 
wearing an unsurprised sort of expression. Hi, you say with way too much perk. The way she doesn't even acknowledge your greeting tells you not to say anymore. There's a spiral stone staircase. The lighthouse keeper begins to climb back up. You assume you are meant to follow. Up, up, you trail her. No landing to catch your breath. No banister to lean on, only climbing. The lighthouse keeper walks easily, lightly. You, on the other hand, are slowing, panting, burning, and this embarrasses you. You hope she doesn't turn around to find your mouth hanging open and your back slumped. The steps appear to be flecked with gold. More and more densely, the higher you go. Her candlelight makes the flecks pop, but only for a second. You're not sure they're actually there. You strain your eyes to look closer. At the top of the stairs is another door and beyond it, a perfectly circular room. Inside, gold. Every last inch covered in gold. Gold in blocks, nuggets, and dust, stacked, piled, and strewn. It is up the walls halfway to the ceiling. Your feet make prints in the gold dust on the floor. There's a small table with two chairs. And though are there more things, you don't notice them much, not with all the gold around. You feel you must be in the right place. The lighthouse keeper takes the kindling and you stand silent in front of the door while she goes about lighting a fire. Now for the chill in her bones, not a sailor's eye searching through the fog, not like when it burned bright and constant each night. She sets a tea kettle on the grill. You wonder if you should offer to help, but she moves like you're not there at all. You aren't sure if you should feel like an intruder coming into her lighthouse or privileged or scared or at ease. So you settle for feeling all these things in a cascading sequence, at least until you know which one fits. She finally sits down on one of the old chintz armchairs that's lost almost all of its upholstery, then lays a woolen blanket over her lap. She gestures for you to sit across from her. You notice she is not old. You can't figure out why she's, why she's called old in rumors and stories. She's barely a woman. You feel a little slighted on her behalf. Her skin is smooth, white as pearl. She has the kind of face that you don't recognize so much as sense to be familiar, if there is such a distinction. In some way, she's family. Perhaps that is what you see. She has noticed you staring, but doesn't cower. She's hard to read. She's mysterious in the way wise people are mysterious, knowing so much that they are always involuntarily hiding secrets. You consider that this might be where the rumor of age comes from. It works on her. It works with her eyes, narrow and angled, yet slightly wistful in expression, as if she's grown tired of all that knowing. Maybe she is old. It's as cold inside the tower as out, but at least you're shielded from the wind. You rub your hands together in your lap, trying to warm them. You stare at the fire, which is still catching, and wait for its heat to reach you. You aren't sure what is supposed to happen now, but as soon as you start searching for something to say, she clears her throat. She begins. The moment Juniper was born was the moment her parents started to fade away. They were opposite ends of an hourglass. When she learned to walk, their legs became heavy. The longer her hair grew, the shorter theirs became. The first time she answered, I love you, was the last time she heard it. Every new thing that Juniper learned was erased from her parents' memories. A thought for a thought, a word for a word, a grain of sand for a single moment. Now Juniper's hair is 14 years long long enough to weave a fishing net fit to catch a whale, so long that most of the length perpetually dragged on the floor behind her, and her parents were nearly bald. They hadn't moved or said a word in years. They deteriorated with each passing tide, their bodies thin and hollow, their skin like dust. Her mother was beautiful once. Her father had a softly sad and handsome face. His hands were worn but soft and sometimes twitched while he lay there like he was reaching for something. 
For all 14 years of Juniper's life, they had lived in the small house at the edge of the bay with its one bedroom and an attic where she slept. The house was propped up on stilts on top of the sand dune and it was slipping down closer and closer toward the water's edge. The stilts reached 50 feet into the earth, sunk in holes that her father himself dug himself with only a trowel, but the sand was not gonna let them stay. Juniper's parents slept in a small bed perfectly in line with the front door. They lay on their backs, limbs tucked in tightly and bodies pressed gently together, their heads pointed to the shore. They were waiting for the house to slip all the way into the water so the tide would pull their bed out and into the bay. Their house was to the north of the Barbary Coast where the dominant winds blew sharply past them. The Barbary Coast had grown threefold at least and at night the gridlocked parade of ships glowed as if it were made of live coals spilled over from the lighthouse. Far from that mass of ships anchored in the shallows, Juniper had always been on the outside and learned about life through a spectator's eyes. She did very little. She spoke to very few. She imagined that the distant Barbary Coast was actually a hole in the earth where the world was swallowing itself, pulling ships from the wide sea into its open ruby-lipped mouth. She admired it like one might admire such a thing, which is to say, from far enough away, hell itself glitters like a goddamn showgirl. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Caitlin. That was so beautiful. Um, yeah, we're on our last reader of the night. It has been such a good night and everyone's done so amazing. So thank you again. Um, so our last reader is Alan Cesaro, pronouns he, him. And he is the author of This Is Not a Frank Ocean cover album and Pinata Theory, um, both from Black Lawrence Press. And on a personal note, both of these are truly incredible collections and I can't recommend them enough. Uh, he's a graduate of June Jordan's Poetry for the People program at UC Berkeley and a former Lawrence Ferlinghetti fellow at USF. His chapbook notes from the Easter span of the Bay Bridge is now available on Ghost City Press. Word. Thank you, Sid. I taught Sid um, back in the day, so it's cool to kind of come full circle. Um, thank you to everybody who read, um, for the organizers. I just want to say, I grew up in the Bay, and it's in, in the South Bay, and I've lived in the East Bay. I went to school, and I worked in the city, so to be in an event like this, where these different universities are coming together, is actually pretty cool, and I'm surprised it doesn't happen more, um, so I just kind of wanted to acknowledge whoever idea this was, like, hella good job on that. Get a raise. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to read, I'm not going to read from any of my works that are out because I'm working on something new. Um, I've actually been thinking a lot about like future spaces and outer space science fiction, being a Mexican American first generation barrier kid. So I'm trying to swirl all that into my new project. So these are all newer poems. I don't believe I've read any of these before. Um, so bear with me, please. The first one is called my Mexican abuela taught me how to land on the moon. I'm not sure if there's ever a perfect, if this light dark cycle will ever reset. If there was an artificial moon, I'd wanna drink its vibrancy in the same way we drink our final moments before they're gone. These days, my circadian rhythm has been rotating against me. These days, I've been learning about extraterrestrials, the ways we imagine alien tongues since we've never encountered anything beyond ourselves. When I first kissed my abuela's language, it felt like I was floating on a third moon. Some people say we've never landed on the first moon. Some people think the world isn't really globed. I don't believe in flatness and rarely consider gravity unless I'm falling. I don't believe in theories of space travel. Have you ever been so lost in your days that you created a future for yourself that didn't make sense? A city in China proposed to build a replica of the moon and hang it like a photograph framed in the night sky. 
They said it could hold the city's light in times of darkness to conserve energy. What if conserving energy was actually a bad thing? What if we never learned to cleanse our mouths of whatever needed saying? I guess I'm not sure if there's ever a perfect moment, if it's worth forming sentences from unknown darks, if we simply imagine what we want, impossible forms of comfort. When my abuelita passed, I didn't cry. She gave me her impossible comfort from two feet away. She gave me many moons in my upturned palms. When I need her, I return to their many surfaces. They keep me grounded with impossibilities. Dedicated to my abuelita and to all the mothers and grandmothers who hold down our families out there. Um, this next poem is called What the Alien Tried Saying in a Language He Does Not Speak. Lately, I'm walking backwards into myself. Lately, I am unspoken. Nepantla, spoken backwards, is liberation. The American territories around my tongue are bordered with resistance. Resistance is not letting anyone inside because resistance is a burning. This is an alternative way of saying forced entry, another sound for memory. My abuela's tongue is the result of someone else's violence. Its violence traces around the emptiness resting on my face. I dream in the inverted silhouette of an upside down question mark in the galaxy swirling above Enyes. These alphabets are scarring the air, breaking down unsplit lips. I choose to break tradition. I asked the traditional machista what he believed about bullet pointed honesty. He answered, bullets. I should have asked him if he's ever learned how to unswallow his own songs. Give me more guidance on how to untether myself from myself, on how to speak in a body unbroken by punctuations. I'm just gonna do one more here. Um, it's called spacesuit or learning how to float through public space. I'm somewhere between high and low altitudes right now where the snow begins to bear hug a rising surface, where the outside looks like a gentle suffocation. I don't mean to suggest there is violence happening. I mean to say these branches can easily become instruments for the body, that rocks and cold air carry more than our breath. I'm where Ashland in Oregon borders on California's edge, though there isn't much change across government state lines. I wonder how many borders are crossed without us ever knowing. I wonder if these signs signal more than our current elevation. A tribe called Quest vibrates from the back of my scold memory. David explains the origins of vaporwave while my battery slow dies. I keep responding to brightly illuminated text messages, but there are hundreds of miles left to go. I'm in the back seat of a Toyota Corolla caught in forward motion. I'm somewhere between high and low and listening to this remixed landscape. I've lost count of the bridges we've slipped beneath. Fanny points to the wingspan of a hawk, points at a car we passed earlier. I didn't notice, but notice how many buildings are ghosted between Portland and here, how the machinery and big wheeled work trucks expand across a slippery spectrum. 
Can you imagine the darkest bodies in space without light to interrupt them? What's the longest you've ever held your breath for anything? Are you still holding? A part of the Sierra forest is gone, chunked into nearby log stacks along the road. A playlist of Bay Area rap never ends like rainfall, but I don't feel trapped by this. I feel a pouring, a downward rumble. This isn't necessarily bad, falling. Isn't it how the ancients wrote about the beginning of new love? I was told that when we're born, we've already fallen into a position. So we must learn how to undo this by walking. I was told we are given only one body to fall into. So we must learn quickly. Thank you, everybody. Much love. Hello, cool hearing everybody. Thanks, Alan. That was awesome. Um, yeah, Alan was my professor at USF. And if you can believe it, he teaches poetry as good as he writes it. So many talents. Um, thanks, dude. And I just want to thank all our readers tonight. And my partner in this, Michelle, is the president of the GWA. She was the one who had this idea and had this vision and she's been amazing. So I'm gonna turn it over to her, but thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, I just wanna say, I'm so proud. You guys were so amazing. And I wanna especially shout out to those of you who showed up from other schools and were brave enough to share your work with us. Um, it's, I'm so deeply moved and we are gonna do this next semester and I'm pretty sure I'm gonna rope Sydney into doing this forever. So once we graduate, we're still gonna do this. I think it's important for all the writers uh, in the Bay Area to, to support and love each other and um, just, wow, thank you so much.